Okay. The way all of a sudden you could do it. And I said, did something happen that made you be able to do it? And she just looked at me with this wondering expression. And she said, I never knew you could fix it. And, and I thought, you know, that is, that is just, that says everything you need to know. We never knew we could fix it because the way we were taught to write, we, you know, it was like the whole ink thing, you had to write in ink and God forbid you should misspell a word. And, and nobody ever taught us because English teachers generally don't know about the creative process, um, which is a part of all kinds of right, all kinds of writing, no matter what you're doing. It doesn't matter, you know, as an essay is creative writing. Um, if it's if it's done the way it should be, because nobody else nobody else could write it the way you could, and so you have to find your own voice and your and your own way of saying what's there. Um, so anyway, just this this whole idea of, of revision, I know, and 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 criticism, which it seems to me the wrong word, or or if not the wrong word, it, it it's a word that makes people tense. Who wants to be criticized, right? That that just doesn't feel good, but. Um, Here's what I came to understand about writing for myself. And, and this is what, it changed me a lot when I figured this out. Um, some of you have probably heard this again because I I'm almost always say it, but um, re, first of all, revision is a natural and necessary part of the process of writing anything, a novel, a story. It's what gives its book, a book the polish. It's what makes it seamless and what makes it seem real. Um, it's, I, think about writing in the same way that I think about translation. And this is, this is what, what made the difference for me. If you think about what it's like to translate a poem, for example, from one language to another, um, you know right away that you cannot make the music of those languages sound the same. French and English, no. <laughs> you can't make them sound the same no matter what you do. Um, the syntax is different. All kinds of things are different. Some things aren't simply aren't translated from one language. They, they just don't make any sense from one language to another. And so the job of the translator is to go back and forth and back and forth. You know, you have to be fluent in both languages and, and you have to keep trying and failing um, so that you feel like the translation, the narrow, the gap between the, the poem in its first language and in the, its second is the narrowest it can possibly be. It can't be any more narrow. And that is what a good translation is. Um, it's the nature of the beast. It can't be anything else. Uh, writing is exactly the same thing. We are in a very literal way translating what's in our head, what's in our heart, what's in our mind's eye, what we know um, about the world, what we know about people. None of those things are words, none of them. And not even dialogue is words when you're in the process of writing it. Um, at least it's not for me. It feels more like a rhythm that I have to find a way to get the words to match. And so just as the translator tries and fails and tries and fails, the writer tries and fails and tries and fails. And you know, you have to become fluent in the language that you're in which you're writing. Um, you have to become knowledgeable about the you know, kind of like the conventions of fiction craft, I guess is what I mean, really, um, which doesn't mean that the best writers don't break the rules because they do, but they know they're breaking the rules and they're breaking them because there's, you know, there's no other way that they can see to do it. And often the great writers have created some new rule, you know, uh, by breaking the, 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 the other ones and, and creating something completely new. So, um, so a novel, a story, a poem, whatever, on the page, whatever the words are in the page, on the page are not the same as, as your idea of the novel, your sense of, your, of the shape, everything. It's never the same. And so there's always, always, always a feeling that, dang, I wanted it to be better. Or dang, I thought it was about this. Or I... wrong I failed I failed did I do something no, I touched the touch this right oops yeah. 
I think I um, was overly excited, Anne. <laughs> I've been hearing you do that before. Sorry. Okay. So, um, if you can accept that, if that makes sense to you, whoa! How great is that? Because you you still may have that feeling. You will have that feeling, but you can dispense with it. I mean, you can remind yourself that this is the case, and that it is perfectly natural, and that every good writer in the world, the ones you admire the most, have that same feeling too. Um, and you will often find. And you may have, you know, saying to a writer one time, oh, I just, I love that book so much. And they get this kind of look on their face, like they're embarrassed or they, you know, it's like, oh, you know, you don't, you have no idea. It's really not that great. Um, and so if you believe that, um, it's not only very helpful, but it also helps you understand what good criticism is, because good criticism is people reading what the words are on the page and making observations about what's there and asking you questions about what's there so that you can begin to see the difference, right? Between what you think is there because that's what you thought you were writing and, um, and what you actually got on the page. Does that make sense? Um, and, and then, you know, when you, when you see it that way, what a great gift it is to, you know, to have somebody. And I, I think, you know, when you do critique groups, um, sometimes they just get weird. I know that. Um, and, and if you can kind of agree from the get-go and even remind each other each time that what we're doing is we're asking questions and we're making observations to help the writer see the difference between what's there and what he wants to be there. Um, and, and if you do it, it's not about whether you like it, it doesn't really matter. And, you know, people say, um, I really, I don't, I, I think you should cut this character or I think he's too mean, or, uh, I don't think a man would ever do that. Well, how helpful is that? Not, it's just not. Um, and, and so what is helpful is, um, well, I'll tell you an example when I was writing, uh, um, my Jack Kerouac book, I have a character in there that I just love. His, his name is Duke and he's, he's a kid and he's, he's just a character. Um, and I had fun, a lot of fun writing him. But um, at one point, you know, in one of the numerous drafts, my agent said, did you mean for him just to be a complete and total jerk? And I said, no, you know, I didn't. I, I, he acts, he's horrible, you know, like some high school kids are. But there's more to him than that. And she said, that's not, yet, not, not there yet. And, and so I had to go back and I had to find ways to make him, uh, to give the reader the sense of him that I had. Because the truth is he had a really big heart um, and he would do things like, this was in 1964. And one of the things I added was him, you know, tipping a, a waitress five bucks in a, in a crummy place. And that would be huge at that time. So, um, what, you know, it, it helps you set, make a list of revision tasks. Um, a lot of the time we, you know, we start out and we get a first draft and, you know, and then you're like, oh my God, what am I going to do now? And, and the only thing you can really think of is to start on page one and work your way through and do your best to, you know, see what needs to be fixed and fix it. Um, that is, that is not a good way, <laughs> way to revise. Um, for one thing, it makes you crazy. Um, you, you can't, you have to find a way to be able to hold it in your head, you know, in a way um, that won't happen when you're doing it that way. You, you, you have a hard time getting, you can't get the bigger, bigger picture. And the other thing that happens is it makes you so nuts that you, it just beats you down. And by the time you get, you know, maybe if you're lucky, two thirds of the way through, you sort of zip through the last third because you've just lost patience with it. So, um, if, you know, if this stuff makes sense to you, um, revision is my favorite part. I love it um, because it's redeeming. You know, it's like, okay, I'm like that little girl. I didn't know you could fix it, right? And as long as I know I could fix it or at least try to fix it, then I feel hopeful, um, you know, about, about the project. So um, Toni Morrison said, revision is the delicious part. And if, you know, if you can sort of, if these things make sense to you, to you you, you may be on your way to be able, being able to think of it that way yourself. Um, so what I wanna do is I wanna give you some thoughts about how I see revision um, and, and also some strategies because who cares what I think, but what are you gonna do, right? 
So um, the first thing I think is really important is to find, you've got to find the focus. Um, and, you know, people talk about themes, but theme is not helpful. I mean, what's it about? That's really abstract. Um, what you need to find is the focus, but how, and how do you find that? And I'm, I'm going to try to hold this thing up. I don't know if you guys can see it, but this is the handout that I gave you guys. All right. Can, can you Zoomers see this at all? Can you see it? Okay, great. Um, okay. Okay. So um, here's how you find the focus. Uh, this is a great little trick. You can use it all, uh, lots of different places as, as, you, as you go. But anyway, um, when we say, when somebody says, Sorry, could you, uh, what's could the you story take about? Could you, take could you take it back? Could you take it back? Like that? That's it. That's it. Thank okay. you. Yeah, You're that's welcome. It. No problem. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank God you're here. Okay. So anyway, this is just a little sentence. It's a trick. Um, and so when 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 somebody asks you or when you're thinking about it, you know, I, like I said, if you say, "Well, my novel is about," it's usually abstract. Whatever you say. Um, but if you say instead, "This is a story about what." happened when and finish that sentence it will give you the focus of your story and you may not always know it when you start out I mean I just finished a novel I've been working on for a couple of years and I didn't figure it out until you know I was already finished with the second draft and I was very confused um, but in any case it so all right so so then what you're looking at is and you know people say well where do I start it um, what do people need to know if you look at this, just the longest line there that's going like that, that, you know, sort of represents the life of the character. And um, did I hit something again? Yeah. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, what am I hitting? I didn't I even know, touch it. <laughs> Maybe it's my page. It's probably my page. Nah, it's it's okay. Okay. Right. You keep talking <laughs> while I'm messing Oh, okay. Um, so the long line is, the life of the character. Um, where you, you see um, moving action with an X, that is the, whatever starts the action, right? Moving action, um, somebody, some people might call it inciting incident or something, but I just think of it as moving action, is the thing that sets a series of problems um, up in the air to be solved, right? So with what you're doing, a lot of time it's a body, right? Um, the, the moving action is a body. You find a body and the arc is all of the time it takes whoever is solving that problem to solve it until where you see X resolution on the other side. Um, so what's beneath the arc between moving action and um, resolution is what I think of as the now of the novel. So in crime fiction, a lot of the time it's shorter than some other fiction. It, it could be a week, it could be two weeks, whatever that time period is, um, is the now of the novel. And the arrows beneath are flashbacks. Um, so if there needs to be a flashback, then the way we use flashbacks is on a need to know basis. We never use a flashback just because it's interesting. Um, we use a flashback because it adds something. Uh, it adds something to the present moment in the novel that that enlightens the reader, um, gives a piece of information that you know we need to know something that happened in the past. I mean, it might be you find the body and, and the the detective at some point reminisces about, uh, oh boy, this seems a lot like this or that. And so then you give us, you know, you give us that flashback and, and, um, and then you move on. They can be a sentence, they can be a paragraph, they could be a whole chapter. There's no rule to how to use flashbacks, the important, except that you use it on a need to know basis. Do not give us a flashback unless we need to know it. And also remember that um, every time you do it, you, you do bring the reader up out of the story, um, at least a little bit. And you also don't 
want to, you don't want to keep him out of the, the now for any longer than you absolutely have to. So you don't want to slow it down too much. It has to be absolutely necessary. So people, um, and, and so anyway, this, this little outline, or whatever you want to call it, diagram, um, is, is very helpful in the first phases of revision. And it's also very helpful, um, you know, in the, in the process of getting the draft down, which is, I mean, you could look at it at any time in the process and help, help you get focused and make sure that, um, that you're on the right track. Because one of the things this thing will tell you is um, if you have a question about whether something belongs in the novel or doesn't belong in the novel, then you look at that question and you're at, you ask yourself, in what way does this thing, whatever it is, does it serve that focus? And if it doesn't serve it, then you don't need it. Um, and, and so in a lot of ways, it's, it's very handy. So it's a handy, um, in the active part of, of um, revision because it helps you ask and answer those questions. Um, but it's also helpful in, in generating a novel too as you, as you go along. So um, that's a great place to start, to just try to figure out and, and you know, get a fix on what is the focus of your novel so that all of the other things, various strategies that you're gonna use, um, they're gonna be playing off of that one thing. Um, okay, so um, lots of ways of revision. As, as I'm sure you know by now, there's, there's really no rule to any of this stuff. It's what you can get away with, you know, and what works. So um, some people revise at the sentence level and they will not, you know, they will not go to sentence two until they have finished sentence one to their satisfaction, which is not to say that they might not change it later, but they just have to work that way. Um, sometimes people work at the page or the paragraph or the page level. Sometimes people work and then they go back and, you know, try to fight, fine tune the, the chapter. Sometimes they wait, you know, they just say, I'm not going to do anything until uh, I get to the first draft. Sometimes they, you know, they revise by theme or issue. They go through and they, you know, they look uh, at what the issues are and, and what it's about. Um, they, you know, you, you might stop and revise when you know that something fundamental is out of whack, right? And, and you have to go back and think. You might, just when you're stuck, and you can't do anything else um, to go back and revise some of the stuff that you've already written can often shake loose um, something that will help you, you move. Um, so different books might require different kinds of revision too. Some books, um, you know, they have different kinds of, of, of problems that you, need, that you need to attend to. So, so anyway, um, that said, here are some of the kinds of revision that uh, we do. And I, for me, break it down in, into a couple of, couple of categories, global and local, right? So global, and global is more, you know, it's bigger. Um, probably the voice, the problems are bigger, probably. Um, and it would be the concept of the novel. Is the concept of the novel, <laughs> you know, it just doesn't work for some reason. It just, it's not gonna work. Um, is the focus out of whack? Do you know the focus? Um, it, is it the right time frame, or is it the wrong time frame? How does time work in the novel? How do we move through time in the novel? Um, a, a, one of the a, a common uh, revision um, thing strategy, or not strategy, but thing to do is to look at um, where the reader gets confused. You know, if you've got a bunch of time different time layers, for example, and you're moving back and forth in time, how does the reader know where they are? How do, are they grounded in time? Um, and, and, uh, and aren't they? And those are not necessarily um, super difficult fixes. They just, you know, they just, you just have to remember that you're supposed to hold the reader by the hand and move them. Um, and, and I think of it sort of like with transitions in time, a little like shoots and ladders. That's sort of what it feels like. You're just there and then then you're somewhere else, but it happens so easily that you know you don't you don't feel any discomfort as a reader. Um, sometimes your characters are just wrong; they're not believable, uh, and that you know that's a big problem in in a novel. Um, the setting may not be authentic. The voice may be problematical for some reason. The point of view might be out of whack. Um, I have had this has happened to me twice. I think maybe three times uh, where I have started out with a three point of view uh, 
uh, idea and ended up realizing that three points of view did not work. And I had to choose the one that may had the most at stake. And so I, you know, I switched um, and I, and I went to point of view, which, which, you know, you think, well, that, how that you just change it. Right. But no, um, because it's, it's a really, uh, it's an interesting thing to do. And, you know, what gets, what, what uh, you lose when you do that. For one thing, I thought, oh, you know, I'm going to lose um, a lot of the voice and some of the incidents from the other characters. But then when I, when I made that change and, and started doing it the other way, what I realized was I was getting a lot of that stuff in by way of scene and dialogue. Whereas before, a lot of it was reflection and probably not as interesting you know, to the reader. So um, lots of things happen. And then there's that issue of what's at stake. Is there enough at stake? Does what, what is at stake make sense? So, you know, those are, um, I think of as maybe global, like you're looking at the whole book, although some of those I just mentioned can be parts of the book too. Um, local, more like economy of scenes and images. Sometimes, you know, you'll look at a book as I do sometimes, because I, I do editing for people. And I think, well, basically that you've already had this thing, you know, the, the scene, it, it, it's maybe a little bit different, but nothing new is, is learned. So either you don't need that scene or you can piggyback the scene, right? And you can make two scenes into one scene so that it's, it's more effective and readable. Um, expansion and development. Sometimes the book seems like it needs more and sometimes it, it, it how are you gonna do that? You know, how are you gonna know um, where you can add things? Cause I don't know about you, but when I'm, you know, working with my own stuff, sometimes I just feel like it's a locked door, you know, and I have to find a way to get that door open or a place where I can open it up to insert something else. Um, you know, so that's, you know, that's one kind. And then of course the other kind is, you know, chopping just, it's way too long and, and you need to figure out what you need. And that, that again, takes you right back to the focus thing, right? Um, because that'll help you, help you do that. Uh, scene versus narrative. Is there enough scene? Um, is the narrative overwhelming? Pace, um, pace is something else. And does it move too fast? Does it move too slow? Are there, um, you know, places in the novel, it might not move too fast all the way through, but I mean, I, I, you have that feeling sometimes when you're reading, I mean, I do with my own stuff where, wait, that just happened too fast. I need, I need something. And, and again, it's not anything, it's that translation. I feel it. It's a shape. It's, it's something amorphous. I don't know what it is, but something is just telling me that I need, that that is too fast and I need something. And then I have to say, what do I need? Um, and I have found that I've done a lot of that fairly recently in, in a couple of books I've been working on. And what often happens is I will, you know, I'll cast or what if this, what if that, what if something else. And then when I, when I get it and I write it, a lot of time I think, how did I ever think that book could not have this in it? And it had never occurred to me until I just needed something. And I, I find that to be so mysterious and wonderful and weird, you know? I mean, in one case, what I did completely resolved a, a, a situation that I knew needed, needed resolution, but I, but I thought I wasn't working on it then. <laughs> and, and it was like, whoa, how about that? I can check that off the list. So that was anything you check off the list is fabulous, right? Um, dialogue, is the dialogue right? Is there too much of it? Um, you know, are there places where you can use indirect dialogue as, as opposed to direct dialogue? Does it move the plot? Um, and, you know, one of the things you're looking at, too, when you're revising is a, a sentence um, really should be doing more than one thing. I mean, it can do a lot of things. It can describe, it can characterize, it can move the plot, it can provide setting. I mean, it, there's, there's just a lot of stuff that any given sentence can do, whether it's, you know, even dialogue um, does does a lot of different jobs, it creates tension. And so, you know, looking at that stuff, really this is, you're looking, you know, kind of line by line and stuff and, and making sure that everything is doing everything it possibly can. Um, yeah, absolutely. Would you say indirect dialogue? Yeah. No, it would be like, um, 
then he told her about, you know, you'd have a, a little dialogue. Well, what happened, and this often works when the reader already knows, right, what happened. And you don't want to go through the whole thing again by way of dialogue. And so rather than do that, you know, um, they start the conversation. She says, well, what in the world happened? And then you can do something like he told her, blah, 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 blah. Um, and, and so you have the sort of the illusion of conversation without dialogue. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Stop me with a question anytime. Um, all right. So there's, there's dialogue. There's point of view lapses. You know, sometimes you'll be reading along and then all of a sudden you got somebody else's thoughts in there. Um, and, you know, depending on what you've, what you've chosen as, as your way of doing this, it has to all be the same um, throughout. Uh, use of flashbacks, chapter lengths, you know, do, do they, are they more or less the same length? Again, there's no rule for it, but it's just something to look at. And if, you know, if they're not and you decide they're not, that's okay. Um, no big deal. Uh, loose ends, like I always think of a novel um, or, well, anything really, but particularly a novel, it's like you're braiding, right? You know, you got these three hunks of hair and you, you can't just leave one out or it's going to look stupid. And, and it's the same thing with the details. You've got these threads running through your novel and you, you, you have to bring them all to the end one way or another. Verb tense that, you know, people are erratic with verb tense. And so you just have to make sure that it's the same throughout present tense, past tense, detail. Uh, is it right? Is it wrong? Uh, clarity, you know, is it clear? Because a lot of time, again, and it's this translation thing, we are so perfectly certain about what is happening as far as we're concerned. And the reader's like, what? You know, the reader may not have a clue. So um, you have to, Tolstoy said clar clarity is beautiful, beautiful just FYI. Um, so, you know, it's all that kind of stuff, grammar and punctuation, of course, but not till the end, you know, that you don't worry about that until the end. So, um, all right, so I'm going to just describe these a little bit and then give you some strategies. Uh, when you're looking at focus, you want to make sure everything in the book does something to underpin and sharpen it. Nothing is there that doesn't in some way make the reader know what the focus is, not necessarily consciously, but whatever. Um, does the end fulfill the promise of the beginning? You know, in the beginning, you're promising the reader something. Um, you're promising whatever it is you're promising. And that first page is going to set up the reader's expectations. And sometimes as novels evolve, they really change. And, and by the time you get to the end, what you thought you were doing, you know, in the beginning, the promise is different. And so then you have to go back through and, and you know, you have to decide, do you want the promise to be different? And if you do, then, you know, you have to adjust the beginning so that it matches the end. Um, and then the other thing is, are all those threads pulled through and resolved? So that's, that's focus. Um, structural is structural problems have more to do with how the book works, how time works, the way point of view is employed. And, you know, sometimes you really have to totally reconceive a book, which I've had to do, you know, a few times. Um, and, and it becomes something different from, from what you thought. For, for example, I love this about an, an American tune. Um, I conceived that book from the get-go as, as back and forth in time. Now then, now then, now then. And I wrote every draft of it that way. It was accepted for publication that way. It was ready to go to print that way. And then a reader, um, it was a university press, so there were readers. And then we got a late report from the reader and the reader said, well, probably the author thought of this, but it could, it could be interesting. There are two stories here. What if you just told the first story and then told the, you know, told the story of the past, told the story of the present? And I was like, gobsmacked. I, I just thought, oh my God, how could I didn't, how, how, how did I think of that? And I went back and I did that. And one of the things I realized was the time frame of the, the, the per, first, you know, it's kind of like the first story, which was the, was the girl's background, covered like almost, almost 10 years.
that, that way it worked it worked really well um and I, you know of course i had to change some things to to do that but it did work um and then as i said with, with a couple of books uh, stranded in harmony everything you want I, I started out with multiple point of view and ended up with the first um, and then uh, this, this is to me one of the more interesting with looking for Jack Kerouac that it was like a plot versus character. And, and you guys deal with this because your, your fiction has to, it has to have a really strong plot or it's not going to work. But you also want the reader to care about the characters. It's, it's more than plot. So um, I'll make this as short as I can. But um, a friend of mine gave me an idea of his that I liked, and it had to do with the writer Jack Kerouac and what he had discovered, which was Jack Kerouac, you know, had ended up in, in just really bad shape in, in uh, Florida and living with his mother and he was a drunk and he was a mess and whatever. And so he had this idea about a kid, you know, looking for Jack Kerouac. And I thought, oh, that's just so cool. And he said, well, I'm not going to use it anymore. You can have it. So I started writing that book and it was, it was kind of just a road trip book. And I, I just couldn't, I just couldn't make it work, you know. Um, and and so I had put it away. And then, um, sadly, one of my sisters had, was diagnosed with uh, terminal brain cancer, and we, you know, kind of all saw her through that. And she had two teenage sons. I had two boys in the novel. And at some point after that, I thought, what if I gave him that problem? And when I did that, that whole book came together, and I love that book it's one of my favorite books because it was that it was my way of looking sideways at my sister's dad right and thinking about oh my god what was that like for those boys um and and so you know that's a, a different kind of structural issue i guess um so so those are a couple of ways economy of scenes and, and uh, images cutting scenes that aren't necessary um whatever i, I said something about that earlier uh, but to solve these problems you got to be willing to get rid of stuff you love. You know, sometimes there's a wonderful passage of writing and you just can't, it doesn't belong in that place. So, um, and then expansion and development, as I said, getting, you know, filling, uh, filling the, filling the spaces, um, cutting back the spaces, whatever. I had, a, uh, with Wish You Were Here, I had, it was funny because I had a very specific, vivid memory of the first time I thought of this secondary character. And in, in this case, a kid runs away and there's a conversation among the group of friends and they're all saying, well, so-and-so said this and so-and-so said something else. And I just remember, you know, I was casting for names at that point because I didn't have names. And I thought, uh, okay, uh, Stephanie, whatever, said this with no idea that this character would, you know, I didn't have any sense of her at all other than as a person who said this sort of flaky thing. Well, she became... Super important as the the book read and 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 you know literally just work so oops, did you want to oh Okay, it just said recording and process. It said recording stop recording and process. Do you want me to? No, she said that back here. Oh, okay. Oh, God forbid I should start. 